Good morning, and thank you all for coming. Today is the 30th day of the 90-day legislative session, and I am joined by Senator Bill Lukowski from East Anchorage, J. Bear, Senator Tom Begich from downtown Anchorage, and I'm Berta Gardner, the Senate Democratic leader, and I represent Midtown Anchorage. I want to start off today by talking about my disappointment that Senate leadership refused to hear the sense of the Senate, tabling it and misusing the option to table. Um, and they've said they'll bring it out. The sense of the Senate is about the, um, well, it's really about standing up and voicing support for Alaskans when the federal government infringes on our state rights. That's what we're doing. We offered a clear opportunity for the Senate to speak with one voice about enforcement of federal marijuana laws. We need to resist the federal government's efforts to overreach their authority, threatening arrest and penalties on Alaskans who are growing, using, or selling marijuana in compliance with our own state laws and regulations. And I'm calling on the Senate to stand up to, and respect Alaskans and our own regulatory authority. Here's the backstory: In 2013, the Cole Memo by former U.S. Attorney General James Cole was a memorandum directing prosecutors to not enforce a federal marijuana laws unless it related to distribution of marijuana to minors, to funneling profits into criminal gangs, using um, violence or allowing marijuana to move from a legal state to a place where it was illegal. Um, and then last month, Senate, the current Attorney General Jeff Sessions repealed the Cole Memo, threatening all the new Alaska businesses. There are 164 businesses right now, and it's growing all the time, involved in marijuana cultivation, retail stores, manufacturing, testing facilities. Um, it is a innovative new business in Alaska. We're calling on the Senate for, to vote on the sense of the Senate. It's time sensitive. We anticipate a visit soon from Senator Murkowski and possibly from Congressman Don Young, who are also pushing back against federal overreach and have made statements against this particular effort. So um, the Senate has said that they will bring it up for us to vote on by the 19th, and I certainly expect to hold them to that. And. With that, we will um, hear from Senator Beckett. He has some related uh, information. Uh, thank you, Senator Gardner. <clears throat> you may have noticed on Monday I in introduced SB 184, which it does relate to the same topic. Alaskans, as you know, voted over 52 percent to uh, legalize marijuana. And whether you supported that or not, that's the law of the land now. And uh, what SB 184 seeks to do is minimize the impact of those convictions so that f if you were convicted of a marijuana crime solely in the past, and it's a crime that would not be a crime today, you would in fact um, have, uh, you, would, you would in fact have a way of minimizing the impact of that conviction on you. Under this bill, over 741 people we've identified would have been, uh, were convicted only of marijuana possession. Under this bill, those, the obstacle that that presents to both housing and jobs would be limited, and the disclosure of that information would be limited. Part of um, the idea behind the bill is similar to activities that are going on across the country in Seattle, San Francisco, and other places where marijuana has been legalized. We are, we are seeing jurisdictions go back and look at these convictions and find ways to basically uh, not disclose them and, and to protect the right and the ability of folks to have a path to better life. What 184 also does is develop a ban-the-box type of legislation. What this would do is create a fair employment process, an opportunity for those who are sentenced with marijuana possession to be able to gain full-time employment. And we all know that that's one of the best ways of reducing recidivism is to have a good job and a pathway to work. Uh, we know the Criminal Justice Working Commission working on the same issues right now. They're looking at a broader passage to expungement and, uh, and issues like that. But I also wanted to take a moment to talk about net neutrality, which came up this week and, and uh, last week as well. Um, I had uh, SB 160 uh, up before Senate Labor and Commerce Committee yesterday, and I wanted to thank Senator Costello for offering that hearing. We had a really good discussion, but I wanted to emphasize why that bill is important and also just briefly mention Senator Wilikowski's work. Net neutrality provided an internet 
that was a platform for economic competition and free communication. That went away with the passage in December of the new regulatory order from the FCC. Internet service providers now can control your access to different websites, and we need to do everything within our power to make sure Alaskans continue to have full access to the Internet. Senator Wilikowski introduced, uh, uh, he is champion for net neutrality, introduced a resolution instructing our federal delegation as to what to do on this, and I'll turn it over to him. Labor and Commerce did hear that bill and passed that one out of their committee last week. Senator Wilikowski. Yeah, thank you, Senator Baggage. Thank you for your leadership on, on net neutrality as well. Uh, I just, real quick, want to talk about the call memo, though. And um, this, uh, through the call memo, the United States government has authorized federal officials to uh, break down people's doors, arrest people, throw them in jail, take away their liberties, and uh, for engaging in an activity that has been legalized by a vote of the people of this state. And the people of this state voted for that because we had a previous uh, memo from the federal government saying uh, we, we could saying they would not be arrested. So this is uh, a very troubling turn of events. Uh, I think every Alaskan should be outraged. This is uh, a, an activity of, that uh, hundreds of Alaskans are engaging in a, a, a legally uh, permissible business activity uh, that has been approved by the voters of the state. Uh, we're collecting taxes for it. This Alaska Supreme Court has said we have a privacy right to possession of uh, in our homes for this. Uh, so I think every Alaskan should be concerned about this. This is an extraordinary overreach by the federal government. And, uh, and I know in the past, um, this body has stood up very strongly for government overreach. And I, I hope we'll uh, take that opportunity to do that again. So can I interrupt just briefly? And just to clarify, it's the repeal of the coal memo that's repeal objectionable. Yeah. yeah, right. The, um, just on, on to net neutrality, uh, this, the, the FCC's decision was a 3-2 decision. It, to reverse net neutrality regulations that had been put in place several years ago. Uh, this will fundamentally change the nature of the Internet. And I think a lot of people, a lot of Alaskans, a lot of Americans are questioning, what, what does this mean for them? What, what, do the, what does the abolition of these regulations mean? This has been described as the biggest threat to free speech in this country. And here's what it could mean. It could mean... Well, here's what it does mean. It means that Internet service providers like Verizon, like AT&T, like Comcast can now legally block websites, censor websites, throttle speeds on the Internet. They could charge different prices for access uh, to various uh, websites. For example, uh, there could be a $10 a month charge for YouTube or Netflix. There could be a $5 a month fee for Facebook or email. There could be 99 cent charges for Google searches. Uh, this will very likely result in more costs to Alaskans, more costs to consumers. Uh, companies like Facebook, Amazon, eBay, Netflix have all expressed opposition to this ruling. Small businesses are concerned about it. Entrepreneurs are concerned about it. Uh, and people say, well, this they've not done it in the past, and that's just simply false. They have done it in the past. For example, uh, AT&T... Um, censored a Pearl Jam concert several years ago after the lead singer spoke out against a past president. The New York Times reported that Verizon blocked uh, text messages from a pro-life group that they found offensive. Uh, religious groups like the Christian Coalition are concerned about this uh, potential for censorship, as are gun groups. Uh, the public process was also deeply flawed. There were millions of comments that, uh, that were, came in on this my staff uh, put together some, some of the Alaskan comments, and we have these, and we're happy to share them with, with the press. But uh, what, what we found was there were 55,000 comments that came from Alaska. <clears throat> of those 55,000 comments, 139 people accounted for nearly half of the comments. And of those 139 people, they, they s submitted multiple submissions. Hundreds of times were submitted uh, from fake addresses, fake names, fake streets, uh, not one single one of these 139 people were registered Alaskan voters. So we've got a deeply flawed process to boot. Now there's uh, fortunately something that can be done to fix this. There's the Congressional Review Act, which was passed several years ago that gives Congress the authority to overturn this regulation, this decision. It currently has 50 votes in the United States Senate. 
It does not have the votes of our current congressional delegation, however. So we pass resolutions all the time in this body, and we wonder about the impacts. This is one that could have a significant impact on, uh, on, on this process. Uh, we think if we pass this, it, could, it will send a strong message to our delegation that Alaskans do not support what's happening on the, um, at, uh, on the net neutrality area. Um, we've had a one, uh, we had a hearing in, uh, on a bill that, a uh, resolution I've sponsored, Senate Joint Resolution 12. It was Labor and Commerce. I want to thank that committee for moving this quickly, Senator Costello. Uh, it's now on to Senate State Affairs, and uh, we're hoping for a quick hearing. I want to talk real quick about the, the permanent fund, uh, the dividend program. That's something that I've been very concerned with and we've all been concerned with. Um, a lot of unfortunate firsts in the last few years on the permanent fund dividend for the last two years, uh, the legislature has failed for the first time in history to inflation-proof the permanent fund when they statutorily should have done so. In 2016, for the first time in history, the governor vetoed the permanent fund dividend. Last year, for the first time in history, the legislature failed to fully fund the permanent fund dividend. Uh, now, for the first time in history, we have some people in this building talking about using the earnings from the earnings reserve account to fund government. Uh, I think we're in agreement that we can use excess earnings to fund government. Uh, however, there needs to be a plan in place before we do so. I think we feel very strongly about that. Uh, part of that plan uh, involves putting the permanent fund dividend in the Constitution. It's the only way we can assure that Alaskans will actually get a dividend. Uh, the Senate majority continues to tout their spending the PFD only plan. This is an extraordinarily regressive way probably the most regressive way to balance the budget. Uh, the research studies that have been done show the permanent fund lifts thousands and thousands of Alaskans out of poverty. There are concerns that this plan would uh, result in the earnings reserve account uh, significantly falling, if not failing within 10 years, uh, resulting in the loss of the dividend completely. So uh, yesterday we had uh, in, this, in the building a dedication uh, an honoring uh, former Senator Representative Al Adams, who uh, was here for a long time, had a, just a really tremendous, tremendous impact for the people of his community and the people of this state. And uh, my, my staff pulled out uh, this letter of intent that uh, then representative, chairman of the uh, House Finance Committee, Al Adams, wrote. And this is a... House Finance Committee letter of intent on the piece of legislation in 1982 that actually created the permanent fund dividend program. And here's what uh, Representative Adams uh, s stated. He said, the committee intends that the payment of dividends shall have first call on 50% of the income of the permanent fund available for distribution, regardless of what other uses the income is put to. This letter of intent is still the intent of the current PFD statute. It is not the intent that the permanent fund dividend be the last call. It's the intent that it be the first call, according to this letter of intent. That is still the law of the land. So we're advocating that before any draws occur on the permanent fund dividend, the people of Alaska have a right to vote on this issue, that we have a right to have a constitutional amendment put before the people. Uh, we have sent, uh, we're sending in a letter to uh, leadership in the Senate urging them to uh, have a hearing. We've got a letter for the press on the table here uh, that we're uh, getting out right now. So thank you. If I could make one last comment. Yes. All three of these themes are tied to the same thing. This is a matter of public interest. Whether it's the public voting on marijuana with over 52% of our citizens voting for it, whether it's protecting the public's interest on net neutrality, or whether protecting the public